Traveling and training as an amateur athlete is difficult sometimes. I value those experiences as as formative ones, but I uh, I will say that they're difficult sometimes. And you know, I always look forward to coming here whenever. You know, those experiences kind of start getting the better of me. I remind myself that, you know, in a matter of weeks, I'll be back in Algonquin Park, swimming in a pristine lake, maybe over to the islands. And the place I always want to come when it's time for a vacation is, is right here. It's a nice building to look at from some angles, but um, it's pretty mouse infested and um, I don't stay in there. I use it for storage. And um, the fire pit out here is, is where I cook most of my food and uh, make coffee and stuff and and then my cabin's up there where I sleep um, and it's pretty simple I mean it's only about 250 square feet but it's a roof over my head um, so I mean really your day is consumed with these menial tasks of chopping wood making food doing the dishes uh, you know it's nice because you just don't have to worry about anything because the day just kind of flows you get your training done in the morning um, it's a perfect place for training. These lakes are all interconnected. I could paddle for 30 or 40 kilometers without looking back, so it's pretty amazing. The fall's here now, and this is like high tourist season in Algonquin because of the, the brilliance of the leaves. Um, it's really, really remarkable. Just as they start to change, because you get the contrast between the green and the reds and the oranges and the yellows, and um, you know, it really blows people away. If you've never been up here before in the fall, then you're missing out because it's, it's pretty spectacular. When you're out on the water and it's totally quiet and all you can hear is a loon call, um, it's nice, it's calming. It's, it's not the Don Valley Parkway, let's put it that way. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's so nice to be here. What a sincere pleasure it is to be addressing a crowd in, in Algonquin Park, truly my favorite place in the whole world. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, hard work. Uh, the name of my, of my speech is called Chop Wood, Carry Water. Those are two things that I've done a lot of in the park since, uh, since kind of making this my second home um, four years ago. Um, as an Olympian, things tend to happen to me in four-year stints. Um, <laughs> I tend to plan in four-year stints and I always think in, senses, in the sense of four. Uh, when I was young, uh, my, my coach, I was racing 1,000 meters, and my coach, uh, Dean Oldershaw, used to tell me to break it down into four, four 250s. So throughout my whole life, I've kind of broken things down into four. And I guess I still do that. Um, the first time I ever came to the park was in 1996 with a school group uh, to Camp Tanamacoon. And uh, it was about eight months after I started uh, training for kayaking competitively. And I actually did my first race here uh, in, in Algonquin Park on Cache Lake. And, uh, or maybe it was Lake Tanamakoon, I forget. It was, it was just uh, a little kayak race. They're putting on a little mini Olympics because that summer the, the Olympics were taking place in Atlanta. And I'd never actually raced my kayak. So it was the Algonquin Park was the first place I ever raced a kayak. Um, I won, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I get really boring, there's a video on behind me. Tune in to, or tune in to just ignore what, uh, what I'm saying. But um, it's a great video that the Toronto Star did of my little, uh, little spot up on, on, on South Tea Lake. Um, four years later, I tried it for my first Olympic team in 2000. I, I failed to make that team, but I learned a lot about myself. I was only 18 years old, so uh, I changed a lot of things in my life. And then four years later um, was a very significant uh, year for me. Uh, I went to my first Olympics in Athens. I had great success, and I came home and, and uh, was invited to Algonquin Park uh, by Michael Budman from Roots um, to enjoy Thanksgiving dinner. And that was my first time in Algonquin Park in eight years. And uh, I just fell in love with it on the day. I remember I paddled. Uh, I, I, did a little jog around one of the, uh, I think the, the hardwood loop, just a, like a mile. I, I just went and checked everything out, everything that I hadn't seen before and, uh, and really fell in love with the park. And then four years later, I found a lease of my own and, uh, and, and acquired a lease on South Tea Lake, uh, which I've, for the past four years, have been uh, kind of curating on my own, I suppose, trying to make it my own, trying to get a, a sense of place uh, for me and, and my family and my friends. Uh, and one thing that has predominated in the last four years has been hard work. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm here today to talk to you about hard work. And uh, not about the 5,000 kilometers a year that I paddle in order to make one really good kilometer at the end of the year. I'm talking about hard work in the form of labor. Uh, everybody knows that hard work creates value in a variety of ways. Um, we, we work hard to, to make money, 
to support ourselves and our families. Uh, we train for fitness and for health, and uh, these are valuable um, aspects of, uh, of life that, that hard work is a necessity for. Um, but there's aspects of, of hard work that, uh, that get created, um, I think, sort of inherently or innately, sort of behind the scenes. And they have a different impact on us. They don't create tangible wealth or, or, or value. They create something different. Um, and for me, I've learned more about myself in that sense in Algonquin Park because at first, when I first came here, the, uh, the, the work seemed um, like tireless and, uh, and fruitless. I'm just carrying water up and down from the dock just to wash dishes or uh, to boil to drink and constantly chopping wood so that we'd have fuel for the, for the trips that we had up here. And uh, I learned over the course of time and over the course of just the past four years, really, how valuable that work has been for me. And, uh, you know, comes in little things like how much better coffee tastes when you boil the water over fire and how much better bagels taste when you toast them over fire and how much better it, like everything just feels. Last night, there was a crazy storm. Who was in Algonquin Park last night? or around Algonquin Park last night. Uh, there was a crazy uh, thunderstorm, and, and I stayed in this little cabin that my brother and I built um, two falls ago, and it's got a, a steel roof on it. It's 240 square feet, and um, it looks a lot better now. This is about halfway. Not that it looks that bad. I don't know. It's okay. Um, but <laughs> that's about halfway through its construction. Anyways, the, the, the refuge that I sought last night in that small building that my brother and I created um, felt better. Than, than it would if I was in my condo in Toronto. I wouldn't have probably noticed that it was raining. And instead, I noticed, I only, not only noticed that it was raining last night, I was terrified by the rain to some degree, and, uh, and I really valued the hard work that my brother and I put into this so that I could spend time in Algonquin Park despite the weather. Um, yeah, so I'm chopping some wood, and I'm just gonna click through these randomly. They, most of these pictures mean absolutely nothing, but there's a couple that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the inherent value of, of hard work is, uh, is something that I've noticed also through training. Um, I've noticed that athletes and, and people that, that work hard are uh, spiritually full people. And people that work hard uh, value, you know, just the application of effort. And I think the application of physical effort, and I'm talking about physical effort, um, is, is something that's somewhat lost uh, on our youth to some degree, and it was touched on by a variety of our speakers today, uh, which I'm so esteemed to be among. And uh, it's, it's something that I think the park can really offer. Um, I'm a recreational user of Algonquin Park, and uh, not, just, not just the lakes. I paddle probably about 800 or 1,000 kilometers a year in Algonquin Park. Um, and only on four or five small lakes, uh, just because I like to paddle on flat water. Um, but also, I, I ski in the cross-country ski trails in the winter, and I run in them when they're not covered in snow. I swim in the lakes, and I snowshoe across them when they're frozen. Um, I mountain bike in the Minasing Trails, and I, I pretty much use the park as much as I can for recreation. And that kind of hard work, that fun kind of hard work, that the only result is really a destination, or sweat, or a tiny bit of fitness measured over years and years of, of hard physical work is something that has added so much to my life as an athlete. And uh, when I look back on my career as an athlete, I, uh, I can't think of anything more valuable than that. Um, the, the work has created uh, you know, fitness on a variety of levels and, and given me medals at the Olympics, but the friendships and the, the improvement in my overall happiness and well-being and, and all the intangibles just seem to make more, more value in my overall life. And, uh, and that's something that I wanted to focus on today. My cabin is water access. So everything that we build uh, has to be brought over by boat, including these little guys. When we bring dogs over, they have to come over by boats. And sometimes, I'm sure there's a few dog owners in here. Some dogs don't like getting into boats, and Molly doesn't like getting into boats, but she's learning. Um, the, the other aspect of, of kind of working in Algonquin, uh, just for ourselves, between my brother and I over the past couple of years, has been how much we've grown together. Uh, my brother and I have been, well, brothers for 27 years. It was his birthday this, this week. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but we've never been closer than, than when we spend time in Algonquin. Uh, just the, the planning of our next project, and then you know, the, the, the purchase of the materials, and then bringing them all over, and, uh, and creating something together um, has been one of the most valuable experiences of my life. And I wouldn't have it without Algonquin Park. Um, I've driven a barge before for example. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever drive a barge, but <laughs> when you need a lot of stuff on an island or across a lake, uh, you need to drive a barge. And uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a hard place to live. Algonquin is, is a raw environment. And uh, when we were building this little thing, it was, it was only November 1st, but it snowed on the floor before we put the roof on. So we had to shovel the floor off, and then there was ice under that. And uh, we were laughing at it as we were, actually we were cursing at first, but <laughs> after the snow was off the ground, we were, I, we were able to laugh at it, and we realized that it's just another, another challenge that somebody's thrown at us, and, and that, that challenge is, has created the, uh, the necessity for more hard work. And, uh, and that was super, super valuable for us. There's a moose. I caught a moose on camera. I had to put it in there. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll, I'll ever look back on, on any of the, uh, the experiences that I've had in sport and the experiences that I'll... I don't have to compare, basically, the experiences, the competitive opportunities that I've had and, uh, and, and the, the experiences that I've had here in Algonquin. Um, but one thing that I do try to share with people when I bring them to the park is the... Uh, is the beauty, the natural beauty, and, and, and obviously the, uh, you know, the, everything that's, that's lost on us as city people. I, I live in Toronto, and I had a couple of friends up um, a few weeks ago, and when I left them, I left them for two days on their own, and uh, they're well acclimatized to Algonquin and, and the experience of Algonquin. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, I was sort of like anxious about leaving city people, as I call them, like I'm a city person myself, uh, in the wilderness on their own. But uh, they sent me the most beautiful text message upon their return and just, you know, talked about how they felt rejuvenated and how the out of doors just sort of provides something that's just unattainable in the city. And uh, that goes back to our first speaker, Miss um, LaRue, who, who talked about uh, the value of the out of doors and, and just being not enclosed by walls and not staring at screens. And uh, my experiences up here are really, really predominated by, by, uh, by those experiences. Uh, this old cabin has been here for, uh, for 60 years and it's on the, the side of my lease. Um, it was built by a man named Al Goodman, who some people might be familiar with. He started Camp New, New Moon and he was a, a Tamaquan. Um, he called me a couple of days after the Olympics, surprisingly, and told me about what it took to build this cabin. And uh, I, I took an interest, obviously, I, I wanted to, to hear all about it. it was, I was super jet-lagged. I had just come back from London. It was like 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's like 4 o'clock in the morning for me or something like that. But I was, felt like I was sort of lost in a dream listening to him talk about uh, how he built this. And he built it by himself. Uh, he, he was working at Camp Tamaqua on South Tea Lake, and he cut down uh, a bunch of spruce trees uh, to build a ball diamond. And he floated them across, and he skinned them. Um, he then stacked them up and let them dry for the winter, and... And then in the spring, he came back and, uh, and stacked them up and cut holes for windows. And he built himself a home out of the woods. <laughs> and uh, he got so much more than a cabin out of it. And he was telling me, you know, the times that he had with his fellow Tamaquins. And then the opportunity that he had to give it away. And he actually just gave it away to a gentleman named um, Stanley Grieben, who, uh, when he passed away, I was able to, to buy it from his estate. And uh, listening to Al talk about his experiences in Algonquin and talk about another young man that he met at, at, uh, at Camp Tamaqua named Bookie Newman, um, who is commemorated by this rock cairn. It's also on my lease, or just off the lease, I should say. And uh, this rock cairn, I, I kind of stumbled across it. There's this like Fred Penner-esque sort of tunnel that you have to go through in order to access it. And I came across it by accident, and there were some trees on it. Uh, when I got to this lease, um, it was just completely covered in trees, fallen trees. Nobody had been there for four or five years, so uh, it was a challenge even to, um, to access the cabin and to just walk around. So there was a tremendous amount of work to be done as soon as we arrived, just in terms of cleaning up. And as a lot of people know, um, who have been around uh, older leases and older sites, uh, it was a very common practice you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago to, to dump their garbage, to dump garbage in some place where you, you'd kind of hope nobody would find it. Um, but we found it. We found all of the garbage that had been dropped on the site, uh, hopefully all of it, for the past 60 years. And, and hauling it off with the use of that barge was a huge pain in the butt. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't fun. We had to hire a, a dumpster. Um, but uh, we got it done. And afterwards, you know, wiping your hands off and going, that garbage is gone because of our hard work. It's, a, it's very simple. Like, it's such a simple idea, and I almost feel silly standing up here talking about how valuable hard work is, but for me, it's just added so much. It's uh, the feeling of, of taking care of a place and achieving a sense of place after you know, so much time spent with good friends and family has been the most valuable experience that I've ever had. This is a photo that my dad took, and uh, he's been uh, an avid photographer for, year, for years, but now that he's been exposed to Algonquin on a personal level, as his photography has really taken off, and, 
it's uh, become you know his main aspiration. He just he bought himself a kayak so that he could you know paddle around and find uh, new places in Algonquin to photograph and to create value with his hard strokes. Um, I'm going to continue to to enjoy Algonquin and actually I wanted to read the uh, inscription on the bottom of of Bookie's uh, cairn. It says. Uh, the date that he was arrived. He, he died uh, far too young. And the inscription reads, uh, Bookie Newman, enjoy Algonquin Park, and may you have a similar experience. Mm -hmm. And so, may you have a similar experience. Thank you.